Good evening and welcome to another episode of Fireside. My name is Brad and together tonight with Matthew, we're going to be presenting very interesting information. This is a recorded episode, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Matthew, are you there? Yes, I'm here, and I am ready to present. <laughs> All right. It's going to be an interesting night. You're, you're still not on uh, video tonight, so I guess we'll just be uh, viewing me. That's terrible. Oh, that's not terrible, Brad. <laughs> yeah, they, everybody, can, everybody gets to count themselves lucky. They just get to see the, the full setup and everything. Uh, <laughs> they got that wonderful fern in the background, a little a map going on back there what is that is that a map of europe what is that a map of, by the <laughs> it's way it's a map of uh the the city i am in i am using that uh, at backdrop i haven't used it yet for another youtube channel that talks a little bit more about the city but um it's uh it's for my uh my other other challenge that i'm doing is that vague enough well, there you go see <laughs> no that's that's fine see we just uh um, this is some great trivia that was added to the channel. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, for tonight's presentation, we are going to focus a bit on a prophecy that has been thrown around. And um, before we get there, it's going to be important that we, we set the stage. And first, I want to just look at a current event uh, that is continuously unfolding, and that is the situation in Israel, specifically the Gaza Strip, and what is happening there. So uh, take, a, take a look at this clip to begin with. Well, Judy, today President Biden and the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu speaking on the phone for the first time since that deadly missile strike on aid workers. It happened earlier this week. One of those victims was a dual U.S.-Canadian citizen. World Central Kitchen saying its workers were traveling in a de-conflicted zone. Ooh. This in two armored cars at the time of the bloodshed. And during their conversation, Biden told Netanyahu the deaths were, quote, unacceptable and that an immediate ceasefire is essential. The president warned of policy changes if Israel does not take steps to better protect civilians and aid workers. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken shedding more light on their discussion. He made clear that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action on these steps. Israel's defense minister has called the airstrike on the World Central Kitchen vehicles a grave mistake, and that was not carried out with the intention of harming workers. Now, hmm. what is that? Well, what happened is there were civilians, aid workers, as you saw, and they were in these marked vehicles, and they were traveling around on the Gaza Strip, and they were hit by Israeli missiles and uh, killed. There were seven people that were killed in this particular strike. Now, I've seen some other videos that suggest that this couldn't possibly be uh, an accident, as Israel is saying, that they have such tight control over the area and their drone surveillance and the fact that the vehicles were marked specifically from the air so that any drones flying overhead would see and know what they were, what their purposes were, and that this was a, just a civilian convoy. It, it's, uh, it's gruesome. You really you hate to see stuff like this because there are a lot of people who are praying for the situation, they're sending aid over, and then there are people who actually physically go to a dangerous region like this to provide, whether it be medical care. In this instance, it was uh, people trying to feed uh, the population of Gaza. I don't know how familiar you are with the situation right now, but they've um, they've been having airdropped in food and supplies, and uh, there have been some nasty situations. Even with the dropping in the supplies, people are hungry. There's been stampedes, and um, yeah, just, just a totally ugly situation as to what happens there. And there, I really want to stress that this is not a political channel. Uh, what's happening in Gaza is tragic. What's happening in Ukraine is tragic. Uh, and all over the world, we have these deadly conflicts, and there really are no winners. Yeah. There's the only temporary winner here really is Satan, mm -hmm. who loves to see the death of uh, humanity. He just hates us so much, and does all in his power to 
to see destruction come upon us. And the funny thing about this particular situation, as you saw, is that the U.S. is reprimanding Israel. And at the very beginning of this conflict in October, it was the insurgents who came out of Gaza, Israel, uh, killed, I think it was up to 1,300, I think is the number that they gave mm -hmm. people. And now the issue is kind of on the other foot where the Israeli military is killing civilians and uh, has been guilty of killing civilians throughout this kind of ongoing siege that's taking place. It's a, it's a situation we need to keep our eyes on because I believe that it does hold a significance. I, I'm not of the school of thought where I think that there is a prophetic fulfillment necessarily, a biblical prophetic fulfillment when it comes to Israel. But I think that we've been set up to the point where the majority of mainstream evangelicals, Christians, Protestants, if you want to call them, they see that situation as one of great importance. Mm. And that you'll see a turning away uh, from falsehood and that all of Israel will come to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then we can officially mm. begin that, that time where Jesus comes and is with them. But, uh, so almost what are like you it's a, about this? It, it's it's so yeah. I mean, you got to treat my conscious, my my mind as as if I haven't paid attention to this news at all because I I haven't <laughs> I haven't seen anything since. Lots of people died. I think it was was it Gaza. Lots of people died, and they were going to this music fest of some kind, and and uh, some they hit. That, yeah, that's the attack yeah. I was I mentioned in yeah. uh, in October. Um, so the situation's that, just been unfolding and ongoing. Awful, awful, and uh, and I know is a, there's a lot of going on over there, and and I want to stress to to everyone. I've always said this on the channel, uh, where we are fed uh, a narrative on the news, we're fed a narrative of who's right and who's wrong, it, with this system. So I want to be very conscious as I'm talking about this, and I'm not telling Matthew. Matthew and I have already talked about this long ago, and we both agree that who knows. Oh, but let's look at it through a lens of the Bible. And understand this because um, it's a tactic of the devil to, to say, hey, it's this side or this side, pick one. And uh, there's much more going on uh, in this spiritual realm than meets the eye, which is essentially what you were saying to Matthew, right? Yes, that is what I'm saying. The, the, the real battle that's being fought is not one that's necessarily visible to us. It's, uh, it's these spirits that are moving behind the scenes to cause as much destruction as possible and to benefit from it as much as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. There is a, there's profit for them in, in this type of activity. Mm -hmm. So that's, I believe, why it's happening. So it wasn't only the major news organizations and uh, other world leaders that were mentioning what had happened in Gaza. The, the Pope, Pope Francis, had something to say about it. And uh, I've got that article here for us, if we want to take a look at oh, it, and yeah. I'll read through it. Yeah, that's perfect. So this is an article from Vatican News. doesn't get more official than that. Pope Francis <laughs> renews appeal for a ceasefire in Gaza. Pope Francis makes his latest plea for a ceasefire in Gaza and appeals for tireless efforts to end the Israel-Hamas war, lamenting the suffering of the civilian population. Hmm. Pope Francis made his latest appeal for an immediate ceasefire in the Gaza Strip during his weekly general audience in the Vatican. Reflecting on the war in the Holy Land, the Pope lamented the tragic news that continues to come from the Middle East. I reiterate, the Holy Father went on to appeal. Holy. My firm request... Well, this is the Vatican oh, news, okay. yeah, yeah. to be fair. <laughs> Not necessarily a mainstream media outlet, but yes... <laughs> It is. It's always a, it's a smack in the face. I think <laughs> when you see Hol Holy Father, what this man on earth? Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Firm request for an immediate ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. The Holy Father, and I'll use quotations there, expressed his deep regret 
for the staff members of the World Central Kitchen killed as they distributed humanitarian aid in Gaza and reassured his prayers for them and their families. On Tuesday, Israeli airstrikes killed seven aid workers in Gaza who were delivering food to the besieged Palestinians with the U.S.-based charity World Central Kitchen. Those killed included three British nationals, an Australian, a Polish national, an American-Canadian dual citizen, and a Palestinian. So, the the Pope has a vested interest in this, and he has called for peace here. He's called for peace in um, Ukraine as well, specifically. Those are the two major theaters that have developed, and they've just kind of... It's so weird. They're just sitting on the back burner, really. They were in the public consciousness for a couple of weeks, and then they just push it push it back. You know, the, the, hmm. I think back burner is appropriate, because... When you think about a stove, you know, you put your uh, main stuff when you're adding your ingredients and you're, you're preparing that. That's on the very front burner. You want to be active on it. But when it's time for it to simmer, right, you got to let the flavors develop a bit. You've got to let the dish come together. You put it on the back burner and you kick the heat down to low. And that's what these situations have become. They're mm. still simmering. They're still being affected and it's still developing, but it's not front and center. It's not receiving the type of attention that it did when it first came about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think that's significant because I anticipate that there will be another theater that will open up before what I think will be a quote unquote World War Three, mm -hmm. if you want to refer to it as that, but a major conflict that does involve the globe. Uh, and I don't know if it's going to necessarily come to I mean, I personally, I do, and this is my own theory here as mm -hmm. to what I've looked at the situation and what I think, I do anticipate some type of mass casualties, mm -hmm. probably in the form of nuclear detonations, whether that be on uh, you know, American, Russian, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, what you name it, soil. But I think that something will come out. And the next theater I anticipate will be centered around China and Taiwan. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I there's agree been with talk that. about that. There's lots of talk. I'm about sure that. you've you've heard the buzz and and what's going on, and the the distance really between the Chinese mainland and Taiwan, it's so ridiculous. It's a strait. <laughs> it's a strait of Taiwan. The, you couldn't get any closer. I mean, if you wanted, it's the same thing with Israel and uh, Gaza, right? Mm -hmm. They just they hopped in some uh, some trucks and. Uh, they just cruised over across the border, like you're saying, to a music festival. Yeah. No anticipation of an attack. It, it could happen the same exact way in Asia. And I, I think there will be a theater there because that just opens up a whole new front where it's U.S. intervention. We haven't really seen U.S. intervention in uh, Ukraine, direct U.S. intervention. We're talking about... Um, like real movements. And we haven't seen it in Israel either. However, there are ships stationed in the Mediterranean in anticipation of this conflict yeah. boiling over. And in the Ukraine, I, the U.S. has depleted its armaments, sending that over to uh, to Ukraine to, to be used against Russia. It's a mess, but these are the wars. These are the rumors of wars, I believe, that Jesus talked about. It's, it's a worldwide phenomenon, and it will be... Uh, it will be all-encompassing. I think that all countries will kind of be picking sides, and ultimately uh, there will be conflict, and it's going to be a type of conflict where it's going to really shake people up. It's going to be drastic, and people are going to be looking for a savior. Do you... And that's... Go ahead. No, Go no, ahead. no. Um, do, do, have you ever been... I mean, I don't know how much you can say about your uh, deployments. Uh, I know you were in the military. Have you ever been on a deployment where you had to go into these areas in Asia? I mean, is that yes. is that something you you can discuss? Uh, yeah, I can I can discuss that. I, I did. Um, I was deployed uh, to Asia specifically and patrolled the waters all the way up from uh, Japan, all the way to, off the coast of India. Eventually, mm. so that entire area. And I can tell you right now, uh, I won't go into specifics and details, but. There, there are always weird things. Um, there are like incidents, kind of, or very close incidents that uh, that take place in the military, where the ships do come up on each other. And the I, I will say the Chinese 
in particular, they like to flex a bit. They <laughs> they see the region that the United States ships are sailing in as their own waters, their mm -hmm. own territories. Mm -hmm. So they do these displays of force. And uh, I mean, let me tell you, in addition to what could happen in Taiwan, it, I, I could definitely see the ships having some type of a conflict. And then that, add, you know, it just ends to, yeah. oh, now we got to send a strike group out. Oh, now we're, uh, we're going to move over here and move over there. And especially if these, nations are coming together which i think we've already seen you know uh, vladimir putin meeting with xi jinping the china and russia for example coming together there's there's an agreement in place there but i think there's that's that's for the public to see and gawk at i think there's a an agreement beyond that even where these world leaders uh, i'd be very surprised if there's anyone holding these offices <laughs> who aren't totally clued into the game plan as to uh it's, it's what's going on conflict wise i mean to some degree i think they all have knowledge of, yeah. the, of a greater yeah. purpose that's meant to come out of this I'm and, always, uh, that includes the pope I'm that always includes the pope by oh the way. it does yeah i mean they're all all linked together somehow I, i'm always amazed at how much communication there is during wartime when they're saying oh oh, oh by the way uh we're gonna bomb you and before we do, we're going to send out a little piece of paper to tell the people that we're going to bomb an area. And then before we do, we'll, we'll send a little bomb that says, uh, boom, so they know to get out of their buildings. And then an hour later, we're going to bomb the building. At least that's what they say they do. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not. I can't. I've never been to war. I've never been deployed. I've never been in the military. But uh, at least that's what CNN's reporting. So... <laughs> <laughs> Um, but right. there is a lot of communication. I mean, how much do you, <laughs> I, mainstream media trust is at an all-time low, and it's for good <laughs> reason. And people, people know that they're being shown they, uh, what the powers that be want them to see, and they're being fed thought processes that, again, it's all beneficial. That's what it is. It's to the benefit of this greater plan. Uh, as for the procedures of bombings and stuff like that, yeah, they've, they've said that in different situations, they've given ample warnings and that type of a thing. But look at, just for an example, uh, withdraw our, our American military withdrawing from Afghanistan and what an absolute train wreck that was. Oh, it was. I mean, you know, like 24 hours and uh, the Taliban has total control over Afghanistan and is now running the Afghani government. <laughs> it's just, I was amazed you don't, you can't at make how much that stuff up. was left. Yeah. 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 Oh, and, and yeah, and, and so much supplies and everything. That's why you can't say at a certain point, right, do we just say, oh, incompetence. Incompetence of the highest degree. They just don't know what they're doing. Uh, I think somebody knows what they're doing. I think that they're a little bit smarter than they get given credit for. And everything just gets brushed off and everything... Uh, you just move on. Like I said, that's that's a great example. What happened in Afghanistan and that withdrawal? Like, yeah, I think people were upset about it for uh, a couple of weeks, and then they just move on. I got emails about it because uh, <laughs> as a veteran, and they were saying legitimately, like, your mental health may be affected by what happened in Afghanistan because there are guys who went over there, and they lost their limbs. They got their yeah. buddies blown up and everything, and they're saying, hey, reach out to us, reach out to our hotlines, and go and see – you know, go to these VA centers if you were involved with that and, and you're having negative thoughts you know, because of what happened there. Because it just feels so pointless. And uh, you got, yeah, got to feel for, feel for uh, people who have been in those situations because it's nasty. Yeah. And it's a hard thing, I think, to realize that what you're doing, ultimately, it was fruitless. And, you know, you, you were lied to. It's, it's hard for pe people to come to the realization that they've been conned. It's it's hard to admit. Go ahead. It is. It reminds me of that story um, of the of Israel losing the Ark of the Covenant to the Philistines. And then when they lose it, they they're like, yeah, we're gonna go out there, we're gonna defeat them. And then they go out there, they lose like five thousand men. And they're like, oh no, what has happened? And that, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant. And they go out there again. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they lose forty thousand or something ridiculous amount of, uh, amount of men. And they're just like beside themselves. What happened? I mean, it, I, I imagine it must be pretty tragic for our soldiers to go out there and, and lose um, lots of people. But uh, imagine, can you imagine what that would do? Losing forty thousand people, 
and, and then and then uh, having the throne of your God taken as a, as a as a result of it. Um, I don't know how it seems like it almost to me seems like that back then they were they were real men. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, I, I, I know I, I, uh, I don't think that there is uh, any downplaying of war in any generation, but man, man, uh, God really had to intervene in order to get that thing back, and so it's, it's, uh, it just reminded me of that because we've been, my wife and I have been reading that devotions. Right, and that's another key uh, part of that story is God's role in it. And, and what was he actively affecting? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Going after the uh, the spiritual aspect of the battle, like and, you know, and the, the physical battle may have been lost, but God won the spiritual battle that was taking place. Right, right. And there's a huge lesson there too. I mean, how in the world uh, did they lose that war? Didn't they have God with them? Didn't they have the throne, uh, the the Ark of the Covenant? Well, it's not an idol, number one, but number two, they lost the war because they weren't close they didn't have that relationship they had fallen away from their their uh their relationship with their god and uh and so it's it's anyway i I guess i'm detouring from the whole story here that you're presenting but it was it was an interesting uh parallel continue please oh that's fine i like it i like the parallel always uh let's finish up this gaza article real quick and then i got some kind of special to share (laughs) all right let's go uh, let me bring it in. Oh, that wasn't what I wanted. There we go. Appeal for the exhausted and suffering civilian population. I renew, he continued, my appeal for the exhausted and suffering civilian population to be allowed access to humanitarian aid and for the hostages to be released immediately. Let us avoid any irresponsible attempts to escalate the conflict in the region, he added, calling for tireless efforts to put an end to this and other wars that continue to bring death and suffering to so many parts of the world. You see, all this, like, I agree with all of this, definitely, I that's how I feel, but... <laughs> But the thing is, just knowing what I know about how the Catholic Church operates outside of the, even the spiritual realm, but the political realm, Mm -hmm. and specifically Jesuits, and we're dealing with Pope Francis, the Jesuit Pope, what he is saying and putting out there, it's like getting it on the record that, hey, this was my position. No matter what you were doing behind the scenes and orchestrating or saying, yes, continue this or don't do that. Or, uh, you know, I'm going to say this in public, but don't worry, you know, just ignore yeah. it. Because that's part of the pleas, too. It's like, oh, they ignored my plea. I, I imagine that things that are being set up, it's all um, it's all about that, that courtroom, eventually, mm-hmm. that's going to happen uh, on Earth. Because eventually there is the divine courtroom where God mm-hmm. passes judgment, and he has this perfect uh, insight and knows exactly who deserves what and what's going to go on. You know, that's one thing. But I think when Satan manifests and claims to be Jesus, he's got to have some judgment of his own. And he's going to have to, you know, go through and do some auditing. And, well, who said what and who supported this and who supported that? And it looks really good for the Pope to be always the guy who's pleading peace, peace, peace on earth. Don't don't be doing anything. And politically, he's not... Uh, ever too heavy-handed in taking a, a position. And that's what the Pope is going to become. He's going to be the, the arbiter of this new religion, and he's going to be a moral figurehead. That's mm-hmm. that's what I think. That's how I can see this playing out. The Holy F- yeah, Right here. The Holy Father concluded the appeal by calling on the faithful to join him in prayer for the silencing of weapons and the return of peace. Pope Francis also made a plea for a ceasefire in the strip in his Urbe, Urbi et Obri address on Easter Sunday. So that's part of the the appeal, and that's a it's a pretty big address. You know, of course, Easter being oh, yeah. one of the majors. So so I went into the catechism, which is an interesting. This is a Catholic catechism, and it's essentially the doctrine of the Catholic Church, and it's all there for you to see. If you want, you can look it up online. There have been different editions that say um, different things. That's a conversation for another time. But this is current, and this is what is in there. And I 
when I was a practicing Catholic, I wasn't aware of this mentality and what the implication of this even is. But this is specifically the section of the glorious advent of Christ, the hope of Israel. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to start reading it. Since the ascension, Christ's coming in glory has been imminent, even though... It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. This eschatological coming should, could be accomplished at any moment, even if both it and the final trial that will precede it are delayed. So that, that little thing there, I mean, I think that there are certain events, though, that are going to be happening. So for it to be accomplished at any moment, I, I would say that God... It could make it happen at any moment, but he has given us an expectation as to what is going to happen. And there is, and that's why it's so important, I think, to know what these events are and what it's going to look like and how it's been described. Because some people who really believe that they could just wake up any day and it's like, boom, Jesus is there. It's like, well, there's, there is a procession of events oh, yeah. that occur before he comes. And I don't, I do not believe those events have occurred quite yet. But I think we're close. I think oh, we're yeah. close to having those events completed. It'll be rapid, rapid ones. Yeah. Yes. It continues. The glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. For a hardening has come upon part of Israel in their unbelief towards Jesus. Wait, say it so again? I can't, I can't read it. So was that last sentence? That's interesting. So this is the precedent now, because I just said, okay, biblically we have these uh, we have these reasons and we have these ways to know when Jesus is coming. This is what the Catechism says is holding off the Jesus's second coming. Glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. For a hardening has come upon part of Israel in their unbelief towards Jesus. Whoa. So that, that totally changes. That's just what I said. I wasn't aware of this type of a teaching. But what this is saying, and, and we'll continue to read it, but what it's saying right here is that Israel needs to come into accordance with Jesus Christ before his return. All of Israel. All of Israel. So, so Catholics, a, uh, essentially, I mean, uh, 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 the teaching from the Catholic Church is that all of Israel, which is primarily, uh, it, it, I could be wrong about this, is primarily Jewish, right? Uh, or is it, it is Jewish. We're gonna uh, we'll we're gonna the, read the definition because I have I have the definition of Israel from the Catechism as well. Let, let me save my face real quick. I I, I realize that sounds like a really dumb question, but with the influx of Islam all over the nation. I can't tell which nation is mostly Islam now and mostly uh, Jewish. I mean, for instance, Sweden is not Swedish anymore. <laughs> I think anyway. Right. It's it's an it's an Arab country essentially. Yeah. With some native Swedes living in it. Right. I mean that that's the reality of the the world we live in right now. Mm -hmm. It's like not no racial implications there. It's just fact. You just look at the statistics, and this is these are the population statistics that you'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, but this uh, yeah, let's let's read on because I want to clarify this point. Then this will be, this is good that I, I, I supplied this. Saint Peter says to the Jews of Jerusalem after Pentecost, there repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive in time. I am for establishing all that God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. St. Paul echoes him, For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? The full inclusion of the Jews in the Messiah's salvation, in the wake of the full number of the Gentiles, will enable the people of God to achieve the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ in which God may be all in all. So that, uh, what? concluding that, go, go can, ahead. Can, can, you, can, you, can you elaborate on what that even said there? My, my, my brain is locked. Uh, it was so many, so many words. What, well, what? here, pull it up. Pull it up. Let's pull it up. Let's have the text in front of us when we discuss it. 
So right here, as, as you're seeing, it's talking, first of all, about this is from Acts uh, 3, I believe, where Peter addresses there's a, the crowd forms and they say, oh, these men are drunk because they're speaking all these different languages and they're not hearing those languages. And it just sounds like they're babbling. They sound like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like they're yeah. saying nothing, but they're actually preaching the gospel, each of them in the tongue of the people who are receiving it. Oh, right, it. right. I do remember this. Yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. miraculous event. So then, so then Peter addresses those uh, the Jews that are gathered there, and, and lets them know this. So they're taking that and they're essentially applying that instance when that happened to this is like an ongoing message that's happening again and again to uh, to those people who are living in Israel, mm -hmm. and then. Again, right here, what they write, the full inclusion of the Jews in the Messiah's salvation. So that answers your question, because you're saying, oh, is it talking about the Muslims who are living in Israel or the Jews who are living in Israel? Well, it's wow. the Jews. So the full inclusion of those people in the wake of the full number of Gentiles. So there are Gentiles, and it's like a numbered thing where mm -hmm. you know we're going to reach however many Gentiles are going to accept Jesus or accepting Jesus, will enable the people of God, and then that's in capital so you know it's talking about a specific people, not just, you know, random people of God, to achieve the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. And that's quoting, they're, they're, they're supplying some scripture here to, uh, to support their position, which we're going to get into mm -hmm. uh, shortly. But I want to go on because this is from a separate section of the Catechism. Oh. Because okay. I, needed, I needed to get a solid definition of Israel when I was dealing with this because I thought like, you yeah, I was like, okay, what is this? talking about mm -hmm. because things are a little more confusing these days ever since the 1960s when the political entity of israel was established suddenly people have this new israel in their mind yeah. and they're not going off of what i believe is the biblical definition of israel which would be people who are uh believers in jesus christ that they are following God properly, the way that the Israelites were always meant to follow God. There is a, a greater spiritual that has come out of what was once a single man, Israel's family. And that is, yeah, what, yeah. You know, that's the body of believers that we have in modern day. It is not necessarily a country with a flag and a prime minister and a military. That's not Israel. Right. That's not the biblical Israel. That is a nation that is calling itself Israel. Mm -hmm. That's my view. On, uh, on so, do you do you think the Vatican the Vatican is thinking that way? Or do you think the Vatican is, is thinking literal Israel? Well, you can see right here because this is the Vatican goes off of the catechism. So, we're gonna look and see how they define Israel. After the patriarchs, God formed Israel as His people by freeing them from slavery in Egypt. He established with them the covenant of Mount Sinai and through Moses, gave them his law so that they would recognize him and serve him as the one living and true God, the provident father and just judge, and so that they would look for the promised Savior. Israel is the priestly people of God, called by the name of the Lord, and the first to hear the word of God, the people of the, quote, elder brethren in the faith of Abraham. Okay, so by there heritage. There is the definition. So by heritage. It is by heritage. Yes, it is by heritage. It is the people who were the first to hear the word of God. It is those specific people is what it's referring to. Wow. So in the catechism, it's not even defining it as the political entity. It's just it's defining it as those specific people, that race of people. Huh. That can be understood from this line here. And then it goes on. Through the prophets, God forms his people in the hope of salvation, in the expectation of a new and everlasting covenant intended for all to be written on their hearts. The prophets proclaim a radical redemption of the people of God. So there we have it again, capitalized. Purification from all their uh, infidelities. A salvation which will include all the nations. Above all, the poor and the humble of the Lord will bear this hope. Such holy women as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Miriam, Deborah, Hannah, Judith, and Esther kept alive the hope of Israel's salvation. The purest figure among them, Mary. Wow. And 
what's what's excluded there too is by the purest figure among them uh, it means sinless right. because mary and catholic ideology was sinless because jesus was sinless and he could not be born in a quote unquote dirty vessel when you then have to ask how was mary the sinless woman born out of a right. dirty vessel right it just Logically, you have to ask, what's going on? And the reason why Jesus Christ, the sinless man, God incarnate, dwelling among us, was born of Mary is because there was the Holy Spirit yeah. is yeah. what quickened Mary's womb. And quickened the womb of Mary's mother, and not to get graphic, but it was Mary's father. That's how that worked. That's how Mary was born. She was not born of the Holy Spirit. She was born of man and is in need of a savior just like anybody else right she took I, and that's not i'm not going to put mary down because that's another catholic talking point as oh if you're not catholic then you don't uh <laughs> you don't have any respect for mary you're just spitting on her so i'm not spitting on her I, I think that's wonderful what she did was excellent the fact that she was you know god's servant and just said let it be done unto me that's that's what we all should be doing if god is coming to us and he has a special desire and a mission for us we should be willing to go forward and say, I trust you, Lord, even though this sounds outlandish, you know, you're going to tell me I'm going to get pregnant. I haven't this Mary's response was, I haven't been with a man. What do you mean? I'm going to be pregnant. Mm -hmm. This doesn't make sense to me, but she wanted God's will to be done and she accepted it. And she consented to what took place. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, you know, there's, we have uh, props to Mary for that and props to all the other biblical figures who were imperfect, imperfect people mm -hmm. who, we're willing to decrease and let the Lord increase. increase. Yeah, that's that's what we need to be looking for when we we look at people from the Bible. We're not looking to see them as sinless beings, uh, other than Jesus Christ. He's the only perfect person. Period. Not mm -hmm. just biblically, but <laughs> out of all of human history. That's, yeah, that's that's who he is. That's our hope. So, talking about the scripture, I just wanted to to mention some of the scriptures that were brought up in oh, the absolutely. catechism, yeah. kind of supporting this idea of, uh, of who Israel is. And specifically here, I actually am going to go into Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, this is uh, 24 through 28. And this is specifically, I'm putting this in here because it was in that uh, first portion. It talks about uh, God may be all in all. And that's after, keep in mind, they, they're saying that's after the Jews accept Jesus Christ here on earth. Mm. That Then God will be all in all. But what does the Bible say? When will that be achieved? Then cometh the end, mm -hmm. when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him that God may be all in all. So based off of this biblical text, when is God, quote, all in all? At the end. At the end. It's right there at the beginning. And mm -hmm. it's not just the end. How do we know? At the end of what? Oh, at the, at the end of a certain age? No. <laughs> when death is destroyed. We're talking Revelation 21 here. We're yeah. talking the end of the story. That is when God may be all in all. Not when a uh, race of people on earth accept Jesus Christ as Messiah, and then suddenly God is all in all. So we could see how the, these end events, and when I say end events, I'm not just like talking end time. We're talking the end end <laughs> events. <laughs> We're talking the very end of the book, people. They've taken this point which is going to happen way at the end of the book, and they threw it forward, so far forward, in time, so that the expectation for when this is fulfilled yeah. can happen before any judgment, before any destruction, before the lake of fire, before <laughs> the thousand-year period. 
<laughs> that's that's what we're seeing. Wow. The Bible is talking about one event, and they are talking about a completely separate event that isn't biblical. That's not the expectation out of reading the text. Wow. Wow. So, did, wow. So it could it sets a stage for a false um, fulfillment of something that isn't biblical. Right. It wow. sets the stage for Satan to come and masquerade as Jesus Christ. Because you can say, well, look, these the Jews on earth have accepted that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They put that error away, mm -hmm. and now he is here with them, dwelling among us once again. He is, it, it's the second coming. The second advent of Jesus Christ has occurred, and he's here walking around with us. Mm -hmm. Not going to happen like that. They, we've talked about it on this channel before, and we don't have to dive into it, but... The idea of when Jesus returns, it's not going to be a big party where everyone gets together and uh, <laughs> all the people of earth and the world leave go and look at the holes in his hands and in his feet and put their hand in their side like a doubting Thomas. That's not what's going to happen. Jesus Christ comes back in glory yeah. and destroys this earth and yeah. takes up those who are redeemed by him. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Wow. Wow, and... and, and uh... And, and destroy this earth because we make war with him, Revelation 16. The, I, I, I know I, I really drum that home on this channel, but I, I think that's an amazing point because I had never heard that in all my, my prophecy seminars I've been to. What? We make war with God? It's right there in the Bible. Okay, all right, enough of that. But I, I think it's, it's, it's fascinating. And the fact that the, that, uh, the Vatican through their catechism, is saying that there's that that Israel has to come to Christ, all of them, I, and a physical uh, Abrahamic. Uh, we have Abraham as our father. Israel has right. to come to has to come to Christ. Huh? Huh? Yes. Come like, to Israel. That is what's required. We have Jesus. Yeah, that's <laughs> that is that is what is required for Jesus to return. But that's not biblical. That's just wow. it's not there. I'd like to take another look at uh, the Bible. Specifically, this one is out of Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one. In Christ Jesus. Yes. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seeds and heirs according to the promise. Wow. Not a promise, because a lot of people like to say, well, there's a, God has uh, certain circumstances for the, the race of Jews, and he has certain circumstances for the Gentiles. No, it's heirs according to the promise, the promise that was given to Abraham. And you are now incorporated into that promise because you have accepted Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I think the text can't get any more clear, too. It's, it's so specific when it says there is neither Jew uh, nor Greek. Because what that's referring to, Greek, you could just substitute in Gentile. You know, there, it, there is no longer a distinction between these two uh, classifications. Because at one time there really was. Uh, the people who are in Israel would be looked at as very strange. They have these, uh, you know, ceremonies and, and these feasts, and they're pointing towards a savior and prophetic fulfillments that these other nations don't have. Like a Greek wouldn't have this expectation. But once he comes to know Jesus Christ, suddenly it makes sense. Mm. Okay, there was a of those expectations. And so set up even more expectations. And I believe will be fulfilled just as he promised that he would come in the flesh and he would die for us so that we could be reconciled to God. It's going to happen the way he says it's going to happen. Mm. Not how, how any other religious body right. is going to, it's going to happen. Right. It's in the Bible. That's all you need. Yeah. Absolutely. Hmm. Right. So now that we've looked at some of the scripture, I have one more article here before we're going to get into another prophecy kind of a thing. 
Uh, and we'll see how biblical it is. <laughs> but <laughs> before we get there, th I think this is very important. So Newsweek published this article. It's Pope Francis issues rare health update. Hmm. And it is it is quite rare to uh, to get some plain plain words on the topic. Pope Francis has said he has no intention of resigning as the head of the Catholic Church as he feels his health is currently good enough to carry on. Excerpts from a new autobiography reveal. The Pope, 87, wrote that he believed the job was ad vitam for life, and therefore I don't see any conditions for renunciation, according to sections published by Italian newspaper Corre della Sera on Thursday. However, the Pope said that he had already signed a letter of resignation in the case a serious physical Im <laughs> impediment occurred. This is a distant hypothesis because I don't have any reasons serious enough to make me think about giving up, he added. <laughs> let's, do, let's do a little bit of like, a, this is one of those things. I'm going to treat this like an exam, right? Where they would do, uh, they would test your critical thinking and your critical reading skills. Brad, do you see a contradiction between the second paragraph and the third paragraph? <laughs> I don't see any reason that for me to resign, but I, I'm gonna. It's it's for life, according to right. the section. Yeah. You know. Yes, and then right down here, he already has signed a letter of resignation in the case that a serious physical uh, impediment has occurred. So. He's what? saying on one hand, yeah, no, I, I, he's saying I'm Pope for life, right? This job is for life, and there isn't, uh, there's no conditions for this situation. But he's but already signed the letter <laughs> that would allow him to resign in case he needs to. So which is it? Like, in, in, I, in case he's, he's not going to do it for life. Right. But it is oh. for life. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, don't forget it. That's... Uh, that's what's going on here. So it's just kind of like weird. Immediately, you just like sense, okay, we're talking out of both sides of our mouth. And uh, no, no one's going to hold this man accountable for that. Anyway, let's just <laughs> let's continue with the article. The week prior, an aide had to read a speech on his behalf as the Pope had bronchitis. While on February 24th, the Vatican said he had been suffering from a mild flu that had later seen him taken to the hospital for tests. Pope Francis has previously dismissed rumors concerning his resignation after stepping back from a trip while recovering from another physical ailment. Over the years, some may have hoped that sooner or later, perhaps after hospitalization, I would make such an announcement, but there is no such risk. Thanks to the Lord, I enjoy good health and, God willing, there are many projects still to be realized, the excerpt read. Pope Francis has faced several controversies during his 11-year tenure, which have sparked public dissent towards his leadership. The pontiff has suggested that even atheists could go to heaven, and that he did not judge homosexuals, as well as taking a softer stance on abortions and remarriage. Yeah, I noticed that. I've heard that, too. You've heard about the softening of the stances? Mm -hmm. It's kind of what's... Uh, it's it's kind of drives the whole um, polarization that I, I've talked about before. How there's this idea that you can be a conservative Catholic or a liberal Catholic, and it it does I, I believe kind of fall in line with the political ideologies of conservative and liberal. But it's specifically talking about this type of a thing. Where do you stand on how the church should treat this issue? Well, I'm a conservative Catholic, so absolutely no uh, birth control, no abortion under any circumstances. Uh, this is, you know, it's a murder, and then you have the more liberal ones who are maybe taking a stance of, well, no, abortion's okay up to a certain point in time. You can <clears throat> take this type of Plan B pills, whatever you want. It, it's always divided, and it goes down these lines, and they slap those labels on it. So Pope Francis definitely falls into the category liberal. more of the liberal, liberal pope. He's a liberal. <laughs> He's a liberal, that Pope Francis. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, what is um, that from? Oh, anyway, <laughs> I was just—I was doing a little Donald Trump impersonation. <laughs> He's a liberal, that that Pope. Um, but anyway, 
Okay, yeah, the can... whole yeah, he's talking about how there's rumors about him resigning, and then again, he's already like kind of signed the paperwork. It's a it's a lot of there's a lot of teasing going on here. I think whenever it comes to Pope Francis's position as as the Pope, especially as it said recently, he's had a lot of uh, it seems like health issues again and again. Yeah. So we'll go to the next uh, part of the article here. The publication of a document in December by a Vatican bishop with the Pope's approval mooting the possibility of blessing couples in irregular situations and same-sex couples without changing the church's stance on homosexuality. Homosexuality. I <laughs> do Trump voice. Has sparked <laughs> growing calls among the clergy to oppose the move. In February, Pope Francis accused the naysayers of hypocrisy arguing that they were willing to let him bless someone who exploits people despite it also being considered a sin. The Sovereign of Vatican City addressed these issues in another excerpt in which he reportedly said that if he had taken issue with all of the complaints, he would be seeing a psychologist. <laughs> wow, <laughs> okay. Just, just imagine seeing the Pope on the therapist's couch. That's a, that's a funny <laughs> image. By the way, the title of Sovereign, it's a, a, you know stuff like that that I find uh, a little impressive here in a Newsweek article. Wouldn't be as impressive as the Vatican uh, news outlet, but Newsweek is not uh, a Vatican news outlet, at oh, least okay. on its face. And it's, it's referring to him as a sovereign, which I don't think that really comes up often enough. I bring it up. I, I, I like to let people know that the Pope is a uh, – that he's an elected – monarch and that it's i believe it is the oldest monarchy in the world right now mm. that, that has been around so uh, take that for for what you will anyway, yeah yeah let's wow. uh let's finish reading let's finish reading the article here however he added that in 2013 con uh the conclave that elected him there was a great desire to change things to abandon certain attitudes that unfortunately still struggle to disappear today there are always those who try to slow down the reform so suddenly he's for reform and reformation, but uh, not the kind you think. It's political reformation. Yeah. It's not going back in line with biblical teachings. It's stirring the pot even more and creating more chaos and confusion to your average uh, church-going Catholic, which is unfortunate because they're going to fixate on this type of a thing that the Pope is, is putting out, and they're not going to look at the fundamental teachings of the Catholic Church and realize that it contradicts what is said in the Bible. That's the hard reality. I had to go through that. It's uh, it's not pretty, but you do. There is no reconciliation between some of the practices of the Catholic Church and what the Bible it clearly states. Mm -hmm. That's that's it. Pope Francis's predecessor, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, at eighty-five, became the first to resign in nearly six hundred years citing his old age and the demands of the job. He went on to live until 2022 and was also known as Pope Emeritus. In the excerpt, Pope Francis, who also holds the title of Bishop of Rome, said in the eventuality he did resign due to poor health, he would not call himself Pope Emeritus, but Bishop Emeritus of Rome, and would move to Santa Maria Mar Maggiore, the largest Catholic church in Rome, to return to being a confessor and bringing communion to the sick. So What's a he's confessor? basically saying a confessor was, well, you sit in the confessional. Oh, it's con right? oh, you know it's what a confessional. Is? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah I, you hear, you hear the sins. I had never heard that man. before. I'm a confessor. Oh, what is your confessing? Then, oh, he's the receiver of the confessions. Okay. Right. And then you absolve them of their sins. That's yeah, the, that was possible. The, the big part there. It's not just I'm going to listen to your sins. It's I'm going to listen to your sins, and then I'm going to forgive your sins. Because God has given me the power to do that. And I don't – yeah, I think that's a – those are pretty big shoes to fill if you're going to go around thinking you're going to absolve people of sins because that's that's God's job. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, can, you can hear if people have issues. Sure, go, you, know, you can tell me what problems you're having, but I'm not going to be the guy who says, all right, you've told me all your issues – Go forward. Don't worry about them. Your sins are forgiven you. No, 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 no. I'm going to say, okay, you've had a talk with me, but that's not going to do any good. You need to have a talk with God. You yeah. need to pray about this. You need to ask for forgiveness from him because I can, you know, I could say all the nice words you want me to say, but they're not going to mean a single thing. Right. It, it's totally between you and God. And, and that's all. So this idea about Pope Francis 
and his role and what he's going to do. There's There's been a lot of buzz around him, not just for the political stuff that he's been known to get up to, but a prophecy that was spoken many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, in fact, by a certain Catholic saint out of Ireland. <laughs> and... I think that it's time that we we discuss it and that we look at it and um, more people become aware of it and its origins because I do see sometimes people will in comment sections even in our videos or in random videos uh, they'll say oh, isn't isn't he supposed to be the last pope isn't Pope Francis supposed to be the last pope before the end of time and I I don't see people citing the source I don't see people like mm. pointing and saying oh it's the reason why people say this is because of this it's just something that's kind of crept into mm -hmm, <laughs> the mm -hmm. collective consciousness of people's minds that Pope Francis is the last Pope Pope Francis is the last Pope well why well let's take a look and we're gonna see why we're gonna we're gonna watch some clips here about the prophecy of the popes Malachi Morgare was nothing less than a saint but despite his faith in the mercy of God he was forced to bear witness to a terrifying vision of divine wrath, a biblical apocalypse that he predicted would occur in our time. Malachi Morgare was the first Irish saint to be canonized by a pope. He was known to, to have some supernatural miracles associated with him. He's most famous now for his prophecy of the popes. In 1139, Malachi made a pilgrimage to Rome to visit the Pope. While ascending one of the city's fabled seven hills, he was struck by a revelation from God. And the story goes that he fell into a trance all that night. He would mention these Latin phrases. De meditate lune, flows florum, pastor et naltua, de labora solis. Each one of these Latin phrases would match up to the reign of a particular pope. And in that vision, he saw 112 popes up until the tribulation time, till the end. We're at 111 now. Pope Benedict XVI is 111. If Malachi's vision was true prophecy, there will be only one more pope to follow Benedict XVI who turned 85 in 2012. In other words, our time may be running out. But why should we believe him? Malachi didn't just predict the number of popes before the end of the world. He also predicted who they would be with startling precision. And what you find is an accuracy, I would say, that exceeds 80%, which I can tell you that got me fascinated by these prophecies and that he's one of the greatest prophets I've ever encountered. Okay, that's, that's interesting. So, I, I have things to say. I want to hear what you have to say first. This is the prophecy of the popes. This is your, consider it a formal introduction. I forgot to mention that this was uh, filmed in the 2000s, so it was before uh, Pope Francis was elected pope. And Benedict was the Pope at the time. But even then, in his own, in that time period, people were still looking at this prophecy and saying, oh, something's going to happen, something's going to happen. We're on our second to last Pope. Now we've only got one more after this. They were counting their Popes before they were elected. <laughs> it's very interesting because I, I, uh, I've heard this before. I've actually heard uh, sermons uh, talking about this, uh, how, how there's only supposed to be so many Popes. And then it went away for a decade, and uh, people stopped talking about it as, as prophecy. Primarily, I think, for one reason, is that it's not biblical. I'm not saying it's, it's not calculated, because uh, I, 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 I wonder about this, because I... Uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me take this angle, because I don't know what angle you're taking it from, so I'm stuttering here for a second. But... Um, I think that Satan is really good at calculating. I don't think he's very good at improving the future, like God can, because he is God. But I, I wonder, I wonder if he's, um, his plan is working almost to schedule, 80% schedule, I guess you could say. That's, that's all I'm going to say. What do, what do you think? 
yes, I think there's calculations that are done, and I think it's very possible. It's like the other uh, occult prophecies that were given revolving around 2025 that we've talked about on oh, this channel, yeah, how right. various prophets from all over the world from different time periods have all pointed and said this is a year of significance 2025 2025 i'm not gonna place a lot of heavy uh <laughs> i don't know i'm not gonna go into the year 2025 and be like this is it the end is, <laughs> is here 2025 but i i know from doing the research that they believe that's the case that they believe there is going to be this earth shaking event so i'm willing to sit back and say you know Go ahead. Let's see. It's kind of like um, Elijah, you know, and the prophets <laughs> of, of Baal. Hey, go ahead. You know, you're making a lot of noise about this. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see what your God does, you know, and maybe your God this time pokes his head in the door and makes an appearance. I'm not going to get unsettled <laughs> by that because I know I know my God is so much more powerful and he is definitely on the way, 100 yeah. percent on the way. And I'm fine with my biblical understanding. I don't I don't need to uh <laughs> to look into the occult world and say oh suddenly i'm going to put stock in, in what they're saying i think satan is calculating i agree with you and he's making certain moves and he wants them to come true because he has to be seen as a prophet notice what that guy said at the end he said with startling accuracy oh, yeah. about 90% accuracy is 90% accuracy good enough for a no. prophet of the one true god not at all no simply isn't you can't you gotta have a batting average of 100 percent. anything less than that and there's no truth in them yeah. we have to there's a, a standard that needs to be held so knowing that there was a uh, some issues with with the prophecies and, and we're going to get into that too uh it, it's just it's funny to see um how people will, will talk about that and and they become very fascinated and fixated on this and suddenly they're they're kind of in a whole new sect right yeah. And that, that happens in Catholicism a lot. That happens. If you look there, I mean, from priesthoods that you can belong to, and they have different kind of aims and goals and uh, creeds. And there's different groups that you could belong to within the Catholic church. And they do different charity work for different things. And some may be a little more sinister than others. When you get behind the scenes, You're talking about like Knights of Columbus, for example, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> just one of the Knights of Malta was another one. Uh, this is, yeah, I don't want to go too heavily into that area, but needless to say, this is, uh, this is the prophecy that, yeah. that people are hinging on. And it's a, it's a Catholic one. It doesn't necessarily appear in the Bible because the Bible doesn't say anything about popes. It doesn't say anything about making a man, uh, the Holy Father on earth. It doesn't say that Peter ever became Holy Father on earth and that people, uh, you know, saw him as Pope, which the word Pope, I mean, it just means father. If you uh, talk to talk to Hispanics, you know, and they refer Papa, it's yeah, literally, Papa. It's, they're yeah. saying dad, that's it. I mean, that's, that's what the word means. Uh, and that's who, who the Pope is. And you're not supposed to do that. Jesus was so clear. He just said, yeah, call, call no man your father. And you have one father, your father in heaven. And it's not talking about your biological father. You're not sinning against God to be calling your biological, because that's a fact. <laughs> you know, my, my father is my father. That's it. Like, I can't deny that. But to then what he's saying is on the spiritual level, specifically when you're going out of your way to call someone, oh, he's my spiritual yeah. father, which not even honestly, not even uh, like Catholics are not the only ones guilty of this. I, I talked to a guy one time at um, kind of like one of those farmers markets and he was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was standing there, he was selling his stuff and he had to you know, some, some Christian iconography around his booth. So I started talking to him about stuff and he was talking about a church he belonged to. I don't know. It kind of got a little weird for me because he was just like, yeah, that man, he is just a genius. He is a visionary. He might be younger than me, but he, he's my father. He's my spiritual father. And I'm what? just like, um, I don't believe. And it was like after a time where I just come out of Catholicism. So I told him, I was just like, yeah, I don't think <laughs> that's uh biblical. Like I, you should be referring to him. Is that, does he want you to call him that? Like, what's going on? <laughs> this is kind of weird to me, uh, especially like with the background. So, like I said, not even it's not like um, I don't want people to think that this is a Catholic bashing fest. Like, you know, total transparency here. I'm a former Catholic. We are looking at a Catholic prophecy here. We're looking at the Catholic catechism. This is a this is something that I once had a very vested interest in. So mm -hmm. I'm here to share this from my experience and I do not hate people who identify as Catholic. I don't even hate the Pope. 
right? He has these health problems. That's terrible. I don't want people to have bronchitis, not able to breathe. That's mm-hmm. awful. I don't. God didn't create us to be sick and die. Mm. He created us to live forever and have relationship with him. And I and it's my desire that Pope Francis repents of his sins and reconciles with God. Whether I whether or not I personally believe that's very likely, that's a totally different point. I the, the mm-hmm. desire that I have for him is that he knows God and receives eternal life and that you know, we get to see him in in the new earth. Yeah, How man. great would that be? Yeah, I think, absolutely. I think that'd be wonderful. So we're going to go on here and we're going to watch a little more of uh, this, another clip from this episode and uh, going to talk about the specific predictions. This gets interesting. Here we go. You have Benedict the 15th, who is called by Malachi, religio depopulata, which means religion devastated or depopulated. In his reign, the Christian faith was decimated. 25 million people dying from World War I. It's also the time of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. And scholars say that 200 million left the Russian Orthodox Church to join the Communist Party. Religion depopulated. After him comes the papal giant, John Paul II, who is called De Labora Solis, which means the sun's labor through eclipse. He was born in 1920 on a total eclipse. Then when he died, he was actually buried during a solar eclipse as well. Obviously, people That's... can't manipulate eclipses. So huh. apparently Malachi really did see a vision of the future. And it would, it, you would have to be divinely inspired, I would say, for it to, to match that accurately. That seems to be a little more than coincidence. Number 111, the final numbered motto, and that is de Gloria Olive, the glory of the olive, or from the glory of the olive. There is a group of Benedictines called the Olivetans. Their symbol is the olive branch. The glory of the olive would be the highest ranking among them, and there he is. We thought, Malachi's correct again, and now there's only one more pope in the line. We are very close to the end of this prophecy. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. That is something else. Huh. It's funny that uh, in the United States there was just a total eclipse, and then they mention the circumstances of uh, Benedict's birth and his death, and that specifically, well, mankind can't manipulate the, the eclipse, so it must have been divinely inspired. I think that ties nicely into what you were talking about with calculating. Yeah, yeah. And, and they can also uh, get permission to destroy life, too, and, and uh, maybe allow life to come together at a certain time, conception at a certain time. We don't know. But that's, that's interesting that they would say that it was only divine divinity that can do this. I don't think so. I, that's interesting. Right, and it's it becomes this uh, this thing as well where... Um, the religion being depopulated too. Like that's another, um, I mean, that would tie in nicely if there is some satanic calculation going on here. You know, he wants to essentially give a false prophecy. And um, we're going to look at the scripture too, to just so everybody knows about what I was referring to with the how, the accuracy that you need. But you can go through and you can... You can set it up so that, oh, yeah, say it's religious depopulation. Well, around that point in time, we're planning on having a major global conflict, and that would fit quite nicely into this area. Now, I don't think they can do it perfectly, obviously, and that's why even they're acknowledging that it's not 100% accurate, that there are some uh, some blips. And I don't know what you would attribute that to. Maybe God didn't have a very good reception at certain points. Is a the internet connection was lagging, given out, and he missed out on something, so he had to stitch it together, uh, and that's why it's it's not 100% accurate. But uh, you know, I do I take issue with that. And here we see this is why specifically, if, if you want to pull up this scripture, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Mm. So that's kind of, uh, th- that's why I have these feelings on uh, the accuracy of it and, and what's going on there. 
Yeah, because if they I think speak, maybe not, there would. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly mm. right. Because this is what Deuteronomy says, and uh, right. Yeah, go ahead. I think you're referring to Isaiah. Uh, I forget the exact chapter, but where it talks about uh, people are going to go after those who have familiar spirits and uh, yeah. to get the truth from them, and then if they speak not according to this word, there is no. Uh, no light, light in, in them. them. I think it's yeah. light, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yes, that's another supporting scripture. There, it's there. It's in the Bible for a reason. It's because this is not new. This is not new, folks. Uh, the, the types of these prophecies have been around for a long time, and it's because Satan wants to take the place of God. Everything you can do, I can do better. He's always singing that song. <laughs> and you know, if... If, if you're going to have prophets, I'm going to have prophets. And, you know, it doesn't even matter if my prophet's not 100% accurate. I'm going to get people to get more invested in what my prophet's saying than what your prophets are saying. You know, you're going to you're gonna put together the Bible. I'm going to put together so many books that people are going to read all of those. And they're not even going to bother to read the book that you're putting together. They're going to be more interested in what I have to say. And it doesn't even matter if it isn't the truth. You know, it's one of the reasons I really, really, truly believe, and I have very little uh, foundation to base this off yet, because I can't find anyone that actually says it in the Bible, but I truly believe Satan thinks, he doesn't believe that God is God. He doesn't believe that. I, I, I don't think so. Because, uh, I mean, what, what happens with all these uh, abduction scenarios? Well, you have this being that comes to people from long distance away, and they say, Jesus is not who he says he is. He's not really God. He's just a, 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 a guy. It might be the deception, but then you have also all this evidence that, that uh, of Satan trying to be God and wanting to be God. How can a created being become a creator of everything unless, you tr unless he truly doesn't believe that God is who he says he is? I, 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 I think we're going to find out that, that Satan truly is, has lost his mind. <laughs> he's yeah. deceived well, himself. He, he's crazy. He's delusional. Um, yeah, there's a <laughs> there's a lot of uh, evidence towards that for sure, and that's a it's an interesting theory, theory. because I know that in some uh, right, yeah, and like Brad said, he's like I don't even like no biblical necessarily support for this exact thing, but yeah. that type of thinking, I, I you know I believe Satan could maybe be that that deluded to think that God isn't who he says he is, uh, because in some of these occult religions, like Gnosticism, for example, the God of the Bible, you know, Yahweh, he's evil. And he's not only is he evil, he's a created being himself, and he's managed to convince other people that he is the original creator and isn't you know, the Alpha and the Omega, that he is the eternal living God. That That is who our God is, but Satan always tries to misrepresent him and... Yeah, to, to go as far as to say he's not actually God, he's a created being who is rogue and he's cruel and he, he made us for these reasons. And maybe that's why he thinks, oh, I can achieve to being God myself because if this created being got to this point, then I'm a created being and I can get to that point. I yeah. don't know. Yeah, the I mean, theory is... of evolution, right? I mean, that's all, all right. these sci-fi yeah. are based on. Them. And, 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 then, and then Revelation 16, I mean, I got, I got stacks and stacks now I'm thinking about it. 16 thinks that uh, Satan is going to use humanity to destroy God, if that was even possible. I mean, you have to be uh, mortal in order to be destroyed. How in the world are you going to get all of humanity to go and fight God? So, so he right. must think that God, anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to take, I well, I, well, what happened with Jesus? I mean, Jesus already proved what's going to happen. Put me on a cross and I'll die. And I'm going to raise right back up because I got life inside of me yeah. and I can put it down and I can pick it back up. That's it. That And that is uh, another proof text, I believe, that points towards Jesus's divinity because he doesn't say there that the father will pick me up. He says, I put down my life and mm. I pick it back up. It is him. He wow. he has life because he is God. He is an immortal being. And I'm sure that Satan thought, oh, you know, I did it. I killed him. See, look at that. Mm -hmm. Because they know who he is. I mean, the, the demons identified him. They knew that Jesus was who he was saying he was. They knew it was, this is God in flesh. Uh-oh. Are you coming here to punish us? It's not yet time for that. You know, we, you know, we still got, there's still some sand in the hourglass. What are you doing here? 
<laughs> you know, for so for Satan to go through with it and have uh, have that betrayal and to uh, ultimately to put Jesus on, on the cross and to to kill him. I mean, that's like for him. I'm sure he thought I'm proving something really great. Another theory of mine before we get back on the prophecy of the Pope's talk, but a theory of mine is that I think that Satan may not have anticipated that Jesus would die on the cross because yes. if he knew that yeah. he is God and that he is immortal and he puts him on the cross, he could have Jesus indefinitely suspended in pain and suffering on a cross. And to this very day, you could go to Jerusalem and look on the hill and see Jesus dangling on a cross. And you could say, this man is cursed of God. He is the most cursed of God. Do you see this eternal punishment? This is what happens when you go against God. And ultimately, what would Satan be saying? If he's pointing at Jesus on the cross and saying, this is what happens when you go against God, he's saying, this is what happens when you go against me, because I'm God of this world. That is, a, And we're talking Satan here. Obviously, we're talking he is delusional. I will say that, that psychotic is not even a, a term that I would use for him, because I think he is beyond that. Um, I, yeah, this is okay. very interesting. While, while we're going to theories, I think that's, that's an interesting theory, too. But check this out. What, what if this... I think that Satan didn't actually believe God was going to, or Jesus was going to die. I, I believe he, uh, Jesus came to save the earth from sin. And by doing, uh, and how did he do that? Well, he was, he was, he was uh, dying on the cross. Everyone knows that. By dying, he saved us. But, well, essentially what happened? Well, see, he kept, he's in his mortal body, without using any of his powers selfishly, he kept what God said a humanity should be keeping, which was the law of love. He kept the love. And, and Satan's like, you can't do this. I'm going to tempt you until the very death. I'll, I'll tempt you to death. I'll tempt you to death. Mm. And, uh, and I will give you so much agony that you will not be able to do this because I'm not able to do it. Look, I'm a, I'm a sinful being. I wasn't able to, and if I can convince, if you fail at this, I should be allowed back into heaven because you couldn't do it, and I. So that means I couldn't do it either, and so he tempted him to the point who's like, okay, and, and I, I can see the 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 council sitting around as Jesus is on the cross, and they're, and they're saying, are we really going to push this this far? Because if he, if we push this this far and he does die, it's over for us. But if we push him this far and he, he says, I'm done with this, you know, all these people hate me, uh, you know what, I'm going to use my power selfishly and I'm going to go back and, uh, and it, see you later, sinners. Right. And he, he takes he off. You're essentially saying, like, if Jesus tapped out, if yeah. he just said, this isn't you, like, humanity is not worth dying for. Right. Like, humanity is not worth this, is what you're saying. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. That's an interesting concept. So, yeah, I don't think I've thought of that before, but that's, no, and, and that's part of what, uh, yeah, uh, dear listeners and viewers at home, the reason why we're even talking about what what was Satan thinking, it's uh, obviously we're not reveling in what Satan has concocted <laughs> in his uh, sin-riddled, diseased mind. It's all the more to point you towards a God that is reasonable, that has a sound mind, that is capable of thinking clearly and presenting the truth without shame, without fear, without having to lie and making you second guess. He, it, there is a level of confidence in God who's rightfully confident in who he is mm -hmm. because he is who he is. He, there's no one else he can possibly be. The face that he presents to you is the face he has. Mm -hmm. This is the God that is worthy of worship, not this a fallen angel demented sitting there uh, just running himself around in circles to what end to what end ultimately to th his own destruction yeah and that's why that's why he's not worth uh, listening to he's not worth following there's no even if he tries to put uh, nuggets of truth even if he tries to give you 90% truth that 10% of falsehood it ain't worth it because you can get 100% purity out of the one true God absolutely so on the bring it back around to the prophecy of the popes, it's it does have a, a level of division as I, as I've found there are all things in the Catholic Church. There's a, a level of two sides to the stories. It is it's a very divided uh, group, and and I think it needs to be reconciled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and 
you know, it's ripe for that in a lot of ways. This is a response to um, the prophecy of the popes by a group. It's called Catholic Answers. Essentially, if you type into Google anything that's a question, um, you know, like, go ahead, do Catholics pray to Mary? I guarantee you, page one, probably the first, second, or third link is going to be to Catholic Answers. And it's essentially a group of different Catholic theologians and thinkers, and they go out of their way to answer questions from, you know, just whoever is asking them. Uh, it's got a lot of different names. Actually, it's funny, um, Paul Thigpen, who was on our most recent broadcast, you remember him? Yeah, yeah. He was talking with Ross Colhart and Tim Burchett. He is a contributor uh, at Catholic Answers as well. Huh. So just just so you have an idea of who we're, we're working with. They're not necessarily uh, just random people sitting mm -hmm. at home, you know, typing out responses like you can edit a Wikipedia page. It's uh, the vetted like people who agree with what the Catholic church has to say. Anyway, here's these guys from Catholic answers, and they're going to talk about prophecy of the popes and see what they have to say. Prophecy of St. Malachi and Pope Francis. Uh, with the way the world is going, I'd like to know, is this really it? Are we living in the end times, capital E, capital T, as we speak? Like, the end, all caps, end, end times? Uh, this is something that we can't know the answer to. Um, the part of the difficulty is that the uh, data from Scripture on this question isn't clear. It, we're not given a clear understanding of when the final end will come. Uh, we may, it's certainly true, it's closer now than it used to be, but that's always true. There, there was apparently an Irish bishop named Malachi or Malachi who allegedly wrote a, pro, a, a, a prophecy of the popes, is another name for it, in mm -hmm. which it's a series of phrases describing different popes between his own day and supposedly the end of the world, although it doesn't actually say that. And these descriptors are somewhat cryptic, uh, but they seem to be fairly accurate down to about the year 1590. And then after 1590, they become much less reliable as mm -hmm. clear descriptors of the popes. And since they were first published in 1595, uh, that has led many people to suggest that they were a forgery um, that were dum, written dum. at that time. Yeah. And that's why they seem unusually accurate before about 1590 and much less accurate after about 1590. And so the Church does not recognize this as a, uh, as a private revelation, and neither do uh, any scholars that I'm aware of, and so I would say that uh, one should not put a lot of weight on this. I understand that Peter the Roman is the last one listed. That's correct, yes. And um, I... I don't know exactly how you would relate that to, and and I, I don't know how you would relate that in this case. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Huh. Plot thickens. Right. Because these guys here, who are kind of dishing it out as somewhat of an authority, are saying, oh, I wouldn't put too much weight on it, and the church doesn't recognize it as a, a revelation. It does, however, come from a canonized saint... And, you know, as, as we've heard before, he has other miraculous things attributed to him. So he's, a, he's an important figure, but this particular thing that he's saying, uh, we're not going to put that much stock into it. But my question is, how true is that? How true is that people are not placing stock in it? Because check out this article from ABC back when... Here we go. Benedict was uh, first coming up. So here we have, have uh, these. I've highlighted what I think is, is important to us. Everything else is kind of, we've been over it. We don't need to rehash. Right here, ABC is reporting that his predictions, Malachi, are taken very seriously. As one report states, in 1958, before the conclave that would elect Pope John the 23rd, Cardinal Spellman of New York hired a boat, filled it with sheep, and sailed up and down the Tiber River to show that he was pastor et nautor, the motto attributed to the next pope in the prophecies. Okay. And if you if you look here, so 
if you look here, this is taken uh, just off of a Wikipedia page here, and number Pope number one seven uh, was going to be called the Shepherd and Sailor. That's the translation from Latin, and it was eventually this man uh, Angelo Giuseppe uh, Roncalli. And he, he was, it wasn't Cardinal Spellman, but it was this guy. And proponents of the, uh, of the prophecies have attempted to link the sailor portion of the motto by interpreting it as a reference to his title, Patriarch of Venice, a maritime city. So you see here is this like very loose, tenuous kind of connection, but this is the kind of lengths people will go to, to just say, oh yeah, Venice, it's traditionally known for uh, <laughs> sea trade. So he's from the city, I guess he's a sailor. I mean, <laughs> okay. I, I don't know about that, um, but what I think is really important here is that there's this uh, cardinal who is potentially being considered to be the pope, and he's relying on this prophecy and taking it so seriously that he's trying to fulfill it. He's trying mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. show people that I'm the guy, I'm the <laughs> I'm the next pope because I fit this prophecy, and, and these are high-ranking members of the church. But then you guys. These uh, theologians from Catholic Answers saying, "Ah, oh, yeah, no one puts that much stock in it." When back in the fifties, huh. ah, they seem to be taking it pretty seriously. Right. If you're going to go to this level, huh. yeah. The Tiber River, by the way, just for people who who don't know, that is the river in Rome. So yeah. it was yeah. a display right there in uh in the capital to to really make his point that here I am, I am ready to sit the throne of Peter. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, there, there you have it, folks. That that's the, the conclusion huh. of, of tonight's presentation. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed this pre-recorded um, episode. Uh, looking forward to seeing some wonderful comments. Thank you for listening and watching this far in. Hope that it's been uh, edifying to you tonight to, to look at some of this material and ultimately uh, as i've said before i i just hope that this points you to god it points you to truth i think it's important that sometimes we go down these paths and we just take a look and say okay what is being said or why yeah just educate ourselves have a knowledge of this stuff so we're not just people who you know when this is brought up we don't have an answer my hope is that next time one of you are going to have a situation where someone's going to bring up pope john or pope uh, francis as the last pope and you're going to have the information now it's not just going to be this weird random point that people are throwing around you're going to know about malachi you're going to know about the 112 popes that are supposed to have happened and you're going to know just how seriously like i said these high-ranking members of the Catholic Church take this prophecy, despite yeah. what you may be told by others. Right, right. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Matthew. This is very interesting. I, I, I'm not being facetious. This is, this is very fascinating how this is, um, some of this has come together, some of this has been taken as a prophecy, and some of it, uh, we'll just see what happens here. <laughs> yeah, we, we will. We will have to see if Francis is indeed the uh the final pope ooh well, <laughs> i mean only time will tell and that goes for all all of this stuff it's uh it's one of those where i'm not upset about it i don't get wrapped up in it and I, i'm willing to just sit back and say you know what let the clock tick cuz uh, you know it'll prove all things anyway you know god god's word stands eternally and, and there you know it doesn't even need to be uh <laughs> i don't know like I'm waiting on it, and I just know that it's going to happen, so I'm cool with that. Any of these other little things that are popping up along the roadside, you know, it's weeds along the straight and narrow path, and uh, <laughs> I ain't going to bother picking them up and putting a bouquet of them together <laughs> and pretending <laughs> that it's it's something I need for my walk with Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, Very good. Well, I can, uh, I can pray us out this evening. Yeah, let's do if it. You, if you'd like me to. Okay. Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us together here to discuss this topic. I want to say a prayer to those men over at Catholic Answers that they can apply some of their critical thinking, their logic skills to what they believe. And I pray that they forsake false attachments and, and false practices 
It's, um, it can be a very difficult thing to do, but all things are possible through you. And your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for bringing us sight, for giving us the ability to hear, for giving us the ability to reason. It's a really beautiful thing, and it shows a lot about your character and the kind of creator you are to allow us to engage in these types of discussions. So I just want to thank you so much for the ability to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Draw closer to God, and he will draw closer to you. Amen. Come and get cozy by the fireside. We love having you here. Good night. We love you, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>